right, we'll start again. Uh, good morning, everybody. I think you, <coughs> Councillor Andy Fitch Tillett, um, I'm the coastal portfolio holder at North Norfolk. Um, welcome, everybody. Um, glad to see some new faces. I'm just pointing out that we are live streaming today's meeting or forum. Um, it will be on YouTube, so if anybody wants to catch up with it later or advise their friends and colleagues to have a look at it, it will be available. I hope that doesn't offend anybody. Um, right, we're in the middle of the wind up to COP27. Climate change is very much on the agenda. Uh, some of you may be aware that we've had quite a lot of media interest. Um, coincidentally, we finally had to demolish a property in Haysborough. And at the same time, the ITB, it covered the dem demolition of a property at Thorpe Nest in East Suffolk, which of course is all part of Coastal Partnership. Going on from there, um, we have a full programme today. I'm very pleased to see Ruben Borsch and Jack Flipbert joining us from Royal Hoskonian. Uh, Peter Carrington, who is very much involved with Wells. Broadlands Futures Initiative with Gavin Rumsey and Kelly Fisher. Now, again, climate change. You will have heard, no doubt, there has been a considerable amount of salination within the Broads area. Um, there's been fish kills. Um, much of which is, um, we've been salination ever since I've been here since 2003, but it is definitely getting worse. It's something that we all have to pay attention to. Then, of course, um, we go to Brian to give us all our maintenance and scheme updates, which I'm sure you're all very keen to hear about. Um, I hope many of you managed to either come to or to log into the Norfolk and Suffolk Coastal Conference, Coastal and Estuaries Conference, I should say. Um, I think we had over 350 people either there or virtually, which is a huge success. Um, and I believe there might be a chance that Essex wished to join us as well, so we could end up being the East Anglian Coastal Conference but that's yet to be confirmed. Obviously, um, the things that are, we've got funding for, we've got CTAP coming along. Rob's going to talk about the coastal erosion risk mapping, which is severely out of date. Um, and so I hope we will all have a very good and enjoyable and interesting meeting. Before I go on to the minutes, um, I would just ask people if they could please have a look um, in the participants list um, on your screen. If you're on a laptop, I think it's at the bottom on an iPad at the top. Could you please make sure that you have your name correctly? Because when I looked through the minutes, there were a few gaps and one or two amendments that need to be made. So if I could ask you just do a quick scan, make sure we've got the right name. I think Gordon Partridge, you're looking at NNDC1. So if you could just change that as well. Other than that, if you can't change it, please put a note in the chat and then we can get everything minuted correctly. Many thanks. Right. Anything further than that, I will, if you may, just go straight through to the minutes. Um, I'm assuming you've all read them. I've commented on the, the members and officers and general attendees. Um, if you could just have a look at those and make sure that we've got them correctly. Um, and again, if it's not quite right, put your name and who you are representing in the chat so that um, Sandra can actually get it down correctly. I'd love to know who Simon was. Perhaps Simon is here today, never mind. Anyway, going on, uh, if we could go through to page one. 
If I don't see any hands up, I'm assuming everything is okay. Page two. Page three. Page four. Page five. Page six. Page seven. Page eight. I have a more. Okay. Um, right. Um, if you are happy, and I don't see any hands up anywhere, um, I will go ahead and sign those off as a correct record. I've just put a note in there, Angie, that my name is spelt incorrectly in the minutes, but it's in the chat, and it's the same as my email address. I don't know if you spotted that. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you very much, Noel, and good to see you. Right. Um, now we're going on to a very interesting bit of work. It's a UK first. It's sandscaping, which is to protect Bacton Gas and the villages of Bacton and Walcott. And if I can hand over to Ruben and Yap um, to just tell us what's been happening in the last now nearly well three years over to yep. you indeed thank you very much uh, angie and uh, thank you all for inviting us to this um i'll start and then uh, ruben will take over uh after a few slides so if you could click please thomas um yeah so i'm yeah, absolutely clear. I, I led the backton scheme leading professional in uh, royal scone dhv in flooding coast resilience and uh, ruben is a colleague Who's a senior coastal consultant uh, and who is who was not directly involved in the scheme at the time, but who is leading on the on the work of the analysis of what's actually going on, what, what how how the beaches are behaving, and he'll talk about that uh, in a few minutes. So if you could click, please. Um, so yeah, we'll talk about um, a little bit of background. Most of you will, uh, I'm sure, know the scheme, but uh, maybe not all of you do. Uh, so at least give that perspective. And then um, yeah, we will talk about how the scheme has developed, what we expect uh, in, the, uh, in, in the coming years in the longer term. And also you'll talk a bit about uh, the digital beach twin that we've developed for uh, Backton Beach. Um, so um, yeah, uh, if you could click again, please. Uh, I'd like like to start with a summary of uh, of what we're of, of what we're going to talk about. Uh, so, in terms of the background, yeah, I think in summary, um, the Backton to Walcott scheme solved the problem that seemed unsolvable by using an innovative approach. Um, and we are doing lots of monitoring uh, and analysis. And because we're doing so much monitoring analysis, we are able to say that uh, the scheme is working as planned. Uh, the sand is moving along the coast as we uh, hoped it would uh, and doing a job uh, uh, when it gets to, uh, to, to the neighboring uh, area. Uh, and yeah, we also still expect the beach to last about 15 to 20 years as we expected uh, in the design stage. So yeah, a bit more detail um, to start on, if you could click please, uh, to start on, that unsolvable problem. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, okay, there we are. Um, yeah, so um, uh, an eroding coastline um, has been eroding since um, since the last ice age, and um, uh, yeah, the, the gas terminal uh, was allowed to protect itself from erosion, but not if that would lead to problems further down the coast at the villages. The villages were also under threat, um, but there wasn't really, or there wasn't an affordable or sustainable solution if you look at that section of coast in isolation. Uh, and that's where um, that's where the project came in to, to, to move away from looking at it in isolation and looking at, at the bigger picture. Uh, so if you could click, please. Um, um, oh, sorry, I'm, I need to move a screen around so that I can see what you're showing. Yeah, that's the right one. Um, sorry. Yeah, there we go. Um, yeah, so this is the beach in front of the villages before sandscaping. Uh, and as you can see, a very low beach. It had dropped by a meter since the seawall was built in, uh, in the middle of the 20th century. And 
yeah, it was hardly possible to get onto the beach even in many cases. Uh, if you click onto the next one, um, and in a storm situation, that was even worse. Um, because yeah, the, the, the buffer that the beach creates wasn't there anymore. So uh, any significant storm would cause flooding. Uh, and at the terminal frontage, uh, they had their own problems too. Um, so if you click again, uh, so you'll see uh, yeah, failing defenses and also the cliffs themselves eroding uh, over time and with every storm losing a few meters. And when the 2013 storm happened, it became really critical. Uh, there wasn't much margin left for the terminal, uh, for the gas terminal. So they, at that point, initiated uh, a project. Um, we were able to conclude that a large-scale beach enlargement, a sandscaping solution, would could work um, and could also be yeah, affordable and sustainable. And that then led to the combined project that in the end happened, where we uh, uh, where we where we carry out the sand saving scheme that meets both the objectives of the terminal, but also for the villages. Um, so yeah, inspired by the, the sand motor in the Netherlands, uh, and yeah, using the same principles really. So if you click, please, the same principles of working with sand, um, uh, working, uh, designing to work with natural processes, uh, working at a large scale, and also aiming to achieve multiple benefits. And of course, that's central to the to the Bacton scheme as well. And if you click again, uh, it's also illustrated by this picture of all the different partners that were involved at the time from the public sector, from the private sector, but also the communities and the businesses and yeah, who also co-funded the scheme uh, in the end and, and helped make it happen. Um, so if you click again, um, just a few pictures of what, uh, what what it all led to, yeah, about the Wembley Stadium full of sand, um, protecting the terminal, creating a beach, and also buying time for the communities and 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 the infrastructure and the businesses to to adapt over time. Uh, yeah, the big picture there is uh, Google Earth capturing um, capturing the, the the work in progress. You can see the dredging vessel there, and if you click a few few times more, you'll see what it looked like um, after placement. Uh, next one, please. Um, yeah, and again. Yeah, just a few pictures of uh, the implementation. Most of you will remember and will have the same memory of this truly spectacular uh, ballet of uh, machines and sand and water uh, in the summer of 2019 uh, to make the scheme, yeah, to, to implement all the sand, to, to place the sand and make, make it happen. My final slides just on the outcomes. Um, so yeah, the community was supportive from the start uh, and wanted Join us to- Join the meeting wanted us to get on with it and that's what we did um and yeah next a few few more clicks please um so yeah the direct out outcomes that i mentioned but also wider outcomes so university of east anglia uh, looked at what what the scheme did to achieve local economic benefits social benefits creating partnerships and also learning um and so the learning uh, if you can click a few more times please um and the learning, yeah, we're making, trying to make the most of that. So we're looking at the UK as a whole to see where this idea, where else this idea could work. And uh, yeah, one of the first places where where there is potential uh, is at Golston Corton. So we're uh, about to start working with uh, with CPE and the local authorities there to uh, to explore whether whether this idea could also work there. So that's the end of my intro, and I'll hand over to Ruben um, to talk about uh, what's actually happened since um, since 2019. Thanks, Jaap. Um, if we could, could go to the next slide, please. Yeah, so since since placement in 2019, um, uh, the terminal companies and NNDC um, have run a, 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 a monitoring program, um, uh, a bit more extensive than the usual uh, a program run by, um, uh, by the uh, Anglian Coast Monitoring Program. Um, Sandscaping, as Jaap says, is a quite a new concept, and so there is uh, uncertainty, and we and we identified that during the design stage. So we developed a monitoring and integrity management plan to be able to manage that uncertainty, and that included triggers for future intervention, which means that um, we we define triggers that if if the beach state, so the shape or the amount of volume of sand on the beach reaches a, a certain well decreases to a certain level, uh, that is a sign that um, action is needed in future. Um, 
so we developed together together with uh, with 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 uh, NNC and with and with the German companies. We developed an enhanced uh, uh, monitoring program, uh, which was which was supported by the Dutch government as well through the, the Partners for Water grant, and that consists out of two things. Uh, on the one side, uh, in, in, in uh, innovative monitoring techniques by um, by our partner, Show Monitoring and Research. Um, that involved, uh, I think if you click one more time, maybe the, the video, no, okay, let's go back one then. Um, the, um, the, um, I was hoping the video of the dredge, of the jet ski would show in the, in the upper right corner, but it doesn't, unfortunately. Um, but, uh, the, the enough of monitoring using, uh, jet skis to be able to reach the lowest water depths combined with, uh, uh terrestrial surveys, which gives us, um, uh, uh, beach, uh, 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 a data set of the beach from the cliff tops all the way to minus 10 below sea level, um, which is which is quite unique. Um, and, and we've been doing analysis on that uh, as, as RCHV uh, to, to determine what has happened, which is what this presentation is about. Um, and we've de been developing as part of the program a digital twin uh, to review uh, regularly the, the remaining lifetime of the scheme uh, and to basically be able to tell uh, what what's going to happen and, and if there's anything we need to do about that. So if you go to the next slide, please. Yeah, there we are. Yeah, so if you go to the next slide, um, there are a few things I want to touch upon in terms of the beach development since 2019. Um, the, adaptation, the adaptations of the beach shape uh, since placement, the spreading of the sand along the coast and the retention of, of, of the originally placed sand. Um, so if you go to the next slide, please. Uh, and just do a few clicks uh, if, you, if you will. Thank you. Yeah, that's that's all right. Um, so the first, there are, there are two two major changes to the beach shape that that most people can see and that and that are important. Um, one of those is uh, mainly at the terminal frontage, and that is the formation of a beach scarp. So that is a, uh, a sudden drop in beach level caused by the uh, adaptation of the uh, of the beach profile to to the well, waves and tides. I um, mean, you can clearly see that in the left image, which is a, a cross section at the beach term of at the at the terminal. Um, so land land is on the left and sea is on the right of that of the left image, and you can see between the dark blue line, which is the profile, the beach profile in in August 2019, and between the the orange line in in 2021, um, uh, quite a high uh, uh, scarp has formed. Um, we've tracked that migration of the scarps that's moving landwards um, at a, a slowing rate. So the, the rate of movement of the, of, the, of the scarp is shown in the bottom right uh, graph. Um, that's slowing down, which, which means that the beach is reaching, uh, is getting closer to, to, an, to an equilibrium state. Um, and 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 the, I think this is one of the features that will be seen by most people on the beach when you're walking past. You see a large wall of sand uh, that was anticipated, and um, yeah, that that that's one of the main developments. And that and that sediment um, that was in front of the terminal that's 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 eaten away by the um, by the waves um, and and landing on the foreshore and spreading along the coast, which I'll touch upon a bit later. So that that is an indication that the scheme is actually doing good work as well. If we can go, if we can do a few more, yeah. So this is an image of that of the scarp, of course, as, as you probably have seen yourself. Um, then the other big uh, adaptation of the beach shape is is uh, the formation of what we call a subtidal bar. So that is a, a sandbar um, which is um, below the the, the 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 low tide mark, basically, outside of the intertidal zone. And um, this is a feature that we know has historically uh, is a historic behavior of the beach, the formation of this of this of this sandbar. Um, and it's good to see that with the large input of sediment into the scheme, into the area, that this has returned and that the beach is showing natural behavior. Um, if we click one more time, yeah, or a few more times actually to, to have the errors appear. There we go. So um, what we've seen is the formation of 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 that bar along actually the whole stretch of coastline. Uh, from sand that's higher up the beach that moves towards the foreshore. Um, uh, under storms, you see generally see uh, migration offshore of that sandbar, and then under calmer conditions, you see that uh, uh, bar moving back, which is exactly what we see in the uh, in the beach cross section on the right there. 
Um, generally in the summer conditions, like I said, we expect that, that sediment to, to move closer to the coast and to merge, sometimes even merge with the coastline to form a, a berm in the intertidal zone. Um, that the sand is there uh, and not on the upper beach does not mean that it doesn't contribute to the protection of the coastline or that it doesn't do its job. Um, instead of being a, a, a literal physical barrier for the waves, it, what it actually does, it takes out the energy out of the waves a little bit further offshore and therefore the impact on the shoreline uh, uh, is less. So, of course, because it's subtitle, you won't necessarily see the sediment, but it's still there and it's still having a, uh, having a, a, a protective function. If we can click, yeah. Um, the next point I want to touch upon was the, the spreading of sand on the coastline. I think I think Yap did mention this in his intro, but um, the design, the, the sand at the terminal at the uh, in the design was meant to spread towards the uh, villages of uh, of, of the back to the wall plot to to keep feeding and to keep keep that protection in place. Um, uh, and what we can see in this graph um, is the the extra sediment compared to the situation before the scheme um, over, over time. Of, um, no, sorry, the, the extra volume uh, since placement. So, so this is basically uh, how much sediment has disappeared uh, or gained since we developed the scheme. And what you can see, of course, that there has been erosion uh, at the terminal, which was expected. Um, and, and uh, but we can clearly see that uh, there has been a gain of sediment at the villages. And so, so actually what the scheme has done over time, over the last two years, is that it, that sediment has moved from the terminal to the beach of the villages, in, basically increasing the protection there. Um, and we can also actually see that even uh, beyond the boundary of the... Um, of the original project. So that is the, the, the dotted gray, gray line at about uh, the 14,000 uh, mark. Um, so that's that's towards towards Haysboro. Um, we, we have actually seen that uh, beach levels have been rising there as well. And you can, you can see that in the data. So that's of course uh, a, a, a quite a positive note. We can go to the next slide. Yeah, so this is a this is a a volume balance uh, of of uh, changes in 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 sand volume at the beach uh, since the placement of the scheme. So since August 2019, uh, and like I said, there, we we actually we've seen uh, an increase in volume at the at the at the villages and and actually further downdrift than that, increase in beach volumes, which. Uh, which is good, and we've seen a loss of sediment at, at the terminal. Uh, it should be said that, of course, we did we did do modeling uh, during the design stages of the of the scheme, and and what we've noticed and what we've what we've observed is that that is uh, that these figures are broadly in line with what we were expected during the design stage, which means that the scheme works as expected, which is great. Um, can move to the next slide, please. Lastly, I wanted to say something about the retention of the placed sand. So we've, of course, we've, we've placed at 1.8 million cubic meters of sand uh, uh, at the beach. How much of that is still there? Because like I said, of course, some of it has moved into uh, the subtitle bar. You can't see it anymore, um, but it's still there. So, so what we can actually see is that uh, at this moment, of, well, in September 2021, which is when we, which is the last, uh, the last data set that we have, um, about 85% of that sediment is still uh, in the project area. So, so that means in front of the terminal or in front of the villages or back to the Walcott. Um, and we actually, and, and you can see here as well, that there actually, has actually been an increase in sediment at the villages uh, and a slow decrease in, 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 in volume at the, at the terminals. So again, uh, sediment is spreading to where we, we hoped it would spread to. And um, yeah, it's, it's performing as we expected. Uh, there's still a lot of sediment from the original volume in place. So if we can go to the next slide, please. Um, in terms of a, of a longer term view of beach development, because uh, that's obviously what, what everyone is interested in, um, 
the estimated lifetime of the of the of the scheme was 15 to 20 years uh, as we, we estimated at the design stage and based on the data that we currently have we still think that is true um, we've seen that the terminal is feeding the villages plus a bit further downdrift so downdrift means uh, in direction of net sediment transport which is uh, in, in southerly direction um, that is happening and uh, we, we, we expect that that will continue to happen uh, in future as well um, and, and that time that that creates uh, can be used to think about adaptation uh, for, for whatever happens after those 15 to 20 years um, in the meantime we'll be uh, we'll be working with North Norfolk District Council and the terminal companies to, to ensure you know, uh, continued monitoring and analysis of the coastline. Um, and and um, based on the data, we can update our modeling to predict the lifetime of the scheme more accurately, which will help with uh, uh, planning any, well, deciding what needs to happen in the future. Uh, and to support this, we've, we've uh, built a digital twin of the beach, a virtual copy. So I'll, I want to say a few words about that, uh, about that next, that's okay. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? And just a few clicks for ticks will work here, I think. Um, so what we've done is um, we've built a, a, a virtual copy uh, of the beach uh, that is fed by uh, the regular monitoring data that we've been, been uh, collecting. So about every half a year, there has been a data set. Um, we've used that data to, to update our uh, our coastal model, uh, together with the actual hydro, uh, the actual waves and tides uh, that have happened, and if we click a few more times, please, uh, we've we've then rerun that model to update the prediction uh, of the coastline for the next 40 years, and together with those triggers for intervention that I mentioned earlier, um, we've updated uh, the time that we expect that uh, a response is 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 required. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? Yeah. So, so most of this is uh, support. The, this whole process was defined in the in the monitoring and integrity management plan. So it's not something we came up with after the design scheme. It was anticipated. But what the digital twin does is um, it, um, it 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 automates large parts of that analysis and it and it presents it in a in a visual way so that it's easy for for decision makers to 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 help them. Uh, come, well, decide on, on what needs to happen in the future. So if we can just go through a few clicks here so that I've got a few more points on that. So what we do is we, we capture data in the physical world. That's in this case, uh, a highly accurate beach surveys, the, the beach survey by shore monitoring and research we've been understanding. We use that to describe uh, the beach in the digital twin to show in, in, in a practical sense, that's updating the numerical model that we have. And then we predict what will happen in the future uh, uh, um, to come to an expected lifetime. Well, that feeds back into the digital twin, which can help decision makers decide about what happen, needs, needs to happen in the future and potentially uh, 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 see changes in the real world. Can we go to the next slide, please? This is what the digital twin looks like. Um, and it, it presents uh, all the data in, in map overview um by clicking on the cross sections the a beach manager can actually see what has happened in the past uh, and what the beach looks like uh, at the late well, at the latest moment that you've got data from i suppose um but also all the modeling results are loaded in here all the updated modeling results uh, and and as you can see on the right bottom side it also presents when actually we expect that some intervention might be needed and where uh, and this, we, we developed this digital beach in close collaboration with NDC, NNDC and with the back to, back to terminal companies. Um, and so we're quite confident that this is, uh, that this will help them in the future to, to manage this piece of coastline. And I think that is the end of my slides. If I go to, yeah. Yeah, shall I hand back to you? 
Yeah, so same slide as I showed at the start, a uh, summary of outcomes. So yeah, I try to get across that uh, by using this innovative approach, we, um, yeah, we are working with all the parties, of course, um, a, a seemingly unsolvable problem was, was solved and addressed. Uh, we're doing lots of monitoring and analysis as Ruben showed. And um, yeah, the conclusion of that analysis is that we can be quite confident that, that the scheme is working as predicted. Um, so yeah. Um, uh, any any questions, I guess? Thank you very much indeed for, for that, Yap and um, Ruben. Uh, there's been one or two um, queries, shall we say, and I want to dispel a bit of the myth because um, there is a belief with some residents that there once was a sea wall between Bacton and Walcott and of course this is actually uh, what we call in the industry the apron which is part of the sea defences and there has been one or two complaints it's now covered in sand. Well I have to say to everybody and I hope Yap and uh, Ruben will agree with me that um, a good beach i.e lots of sand is the best form of coast defence and this has actually proved it. Absolutely, yeah. No, and I think it, it's it's it, it it's been tested, hasn't it? The scheme has been tested. There have been a few reasonable storms since it was placed, which moved the sand around, of course, but which didn't cause flooding. And uh, yeah, I th certainly, what we heard is people worried before, but confident uh, and and just experiencing that the beach was actually dampening the waves and, and stopping the flooding. It's particularly useful that it's it's gone offshore, as you say, it's breaking down the energy of the of the waves. Um, I don't see any hands for any questions. I see. Yeah, there's a question That's on three. the, in the yes. chat. Oh, they're in the chat. Right, go ahead. Um, you've got Eric Vardy, um, Noel Gaylor, and Gordon Partridge have got their hands raised. Angie, I don't know why you can't see them. Uh, probably because the um, presentation is still up on the screen. Okay. Okay. Um, could you just read those out? Here? Yes, I've got Eric Vardy, Noel Gaylor, and then Gordon Partridge. Mm -hmm. Eric, you first. Oh, thank you very much, Chair. Yes, uh, that was really interesting, and there's a great deal of uh, optimism going forward for this. Just on a, a side thing, which I don't know whether this will impact on your um work or projections or whatever but we've seen uh, i'm trying to talk about climate change in a sense uh, that we know that uh, you know they said that uh, we're hoping to contain the climate change um uh increase temperature increase to 1.5 degrees and that's um going to be unlikely i think by what i've read recently in the uh, uh in the media etc uh and of course this is globally what what um if, if the sea levels rise due to climate change, um, what uh, it, it, does your model project uh, how it can, uh, uh, what interventions might have to take place to prevent that uh, impacting on the coastal communities? Um, so, um, I, I, yeah, I, it, in principle, um, so we, we've taken uh certain levels of climate change into account and indeed uh, higher sea levels essentially allow bigger waves to reach the coast uh, and therefore speed up the processes in principle and so that that's we've taken that into account you have to you have to realize though that even though clearly climate change is urgent and sea level rise is a real problem the time scales of that are are sort of when we look at a 15 to 20 year time scale for this scheme the changes even in the worst case scenarios are not so big that you really notice them so so much so it's more for what happens after 20 years and what happens maybe after 30 40 years that that's where it starts to really bite uh, and yeah so what the models will tell us is that yeah you would have well for the same sort of design same volume of sediment you would probably have a a, a shorter life, so a, a, a faster renourishment um, interval, essentially. Uh, so, yeah, in principle, that, that the model can, uh, can can answer those questions too at the local level. Uh, great, thank you. Just as a thing, so I mean, it's all about uh, uh, reassuring our communities uh, about because mm. uh, it does reach the media. This, and as you know, and mm. it's a case of how we reacted and the concerns it may raise. 
amongst the communities that might be affected. So, uh, yeah, so that's that that pretty much answers it. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for that. Yeah, um, Noel. Yes, uh, first of all, just to say thank you for that fantastic uh, way of explaining this. This is the best way I've, I've ever you know, seen this technology explained, including like on the web and so on. But I have a question regarding the um, LiDAR technology. Um, I understand that it's very precise in the way that it can discern the different heights of objects. But um, others have cast doubt on the accuracy, as in terms of the absolute um, position of any parts of that LiDAR scan. Now, I would have thought that with modern uh, GPS technology that certain large objects and maybe ordnance datum points could be measured at the same time as the LiDAR scan is taken in order to, to calibrate that uh, LiDAR scan. Could you sort of um, either confirm that that is what's done or dispel, you know, and possibly dispel the myth that this this is not that accurate? Thank you. Yeah, I, 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 I'd, I'd strongly dispel that myth if I, if I can, please, because um, LiDAR data is proven, if LiDAR, um, uh, the terrestrial surveying using LiDAR is a, is a proven technique, and, and, and it uses RTK uh, GPS, which means that um, uh, the vehicle that uh, carries the LiDAR instruments is tracked with a GPS system, um, but on the same time, uh, a base station, which you can actually see on the slide here, the, the, the tripod that is, that's positioned over there, that is positioned on one of the uh, known uh, measured uh, uh, points uh, on the, uh, on the uh, well, on the, on, the, on the terminal property, and um, that links with the uh, GPS on the vehicle. So there is actually, there is a, 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 it is linked to a base point and that is how it's calibrated. And, and actually um, uh, Shaw does present us with uh, 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 measures of accuracy of that data after each campaign, uh, because because uh, using a stationary base, with, with using that stationary base, uh, base station, they can they can do that calibration that you're talking about. So um, yeah, I, I'd 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 strongly want to stress that this data is is accurate and it's a proven technology. I Thank hope you. That helps. Thank you very much for that. Um, it's very very assuring. Are you happy with that, Noel? You're on mute. Sorry, I was just struggling to lower my hand and, and lost the screen. <laughs> yes, that's fantastic. Thank you very much. Brilliant. OK, good. Good to see you. Good morning. Uh, you did have you need time. to unmute. Yeah, I should be off now. Sorry. Uh, yes, good morning. Uh, great presentation. Thank you for that. Um, Unfortunately, just towards the end of Ruben's presentation, my internet connection dropped out, one of the joys of living in rural Norfolk. So yeah. you may have already covered this, but um, it was mentioned in your digital twin, you can obviously put in predicted data such as sea level rise through climate change. Can it also be used to look at short term impacts such as a North Sea surge or something like that? And can that be used to predict how the effects on the uh, soundscaping would be? Yeah, do you want to add that? Yes, yeah, sure. I'll, I'll start and you, you may want to add Ruben, but no, the version we developed doesn't do that uh, because it is aimed at this longer term inter investment question. But in principle, and we, yeah, we've thought about and talked about that as well, the idea of a digital twin, twin can, can in principle be used for sort of any any management question that needs uh, that needs to be supported. Uh, so uh, yeah, so we, we, for example, as part of the design, we have looked at uh, what would be the impact of a big storm happening, like the, uh, the, the we actually calculated the impact of the 2013 storm, uh, uh, just to understand so how dynamic would it be? And yeah, in, at least in theory, you could develop a digital twin 
that tell that that they uses a predicted storm as input and tells you well this is what we expect to happen uh, during during the storm but that's not what this digital twin is aimed to do thank you okay um i have worked out now how to find out who's got their hand up you'll be pleased to hear um we are talking, I don't think there's any more questions now. There's a question uh, in the chat, and oh, is there is now? Councillor Sorry. Withington. Okay, and I can see that Rob has his hand up. So Tony Thomas has put his hand up as well, I think. Yep. Oh dear. Has he? Okay, <laughs> if I go to Liz first, then um, Rob, and then Tony. Liz. Thank you. Um, I was just wondering, I, I'm sure you have done this, but I haven't ever seen it in um, the displays we've had so far. Is there a sort of image or digital model as part of the digital twin that shows what would have happened had no intervention with sunscaping taken place? Because I think it would be quite interesting for the public to see that, to realise that actually this is having such a positive outcome. Um, yeah, so you can look at that in um, in a longer term and in the shorter and and in a more in the immediate term. So, for example, what you could do, what we haven't done, but what you could do is look at the actual storms that, for example, happened in what was it October 2019, a few weeks after placement. Um, it I, yeah, it would be interesting, uh, I'm sure, to see. So, if that storm had happened in June before placement, what sort of uh, overtopping and flooding would have occurred? That, that's not happened in, and it's something that yeah, could, could be done with the right data. Um, there is the other thing of what would be, uh, what is the long-term development of the coastline, but also how would that then affect the terminal and the villages? Uh, and that was uh, yeah, a crucial part of the business case for the scheme. Uh, you always start with a do nothing scenario. So what are the damages if you don't do this intervention? And yeah, so clearly devastating impact on the terminal and yeah, the UK's gas supply, uh, but also uh, yeah, a potentially rapid failure of the, of the sea defences, loss of the road, loss of houses and flooding of the houses. So that all of that is, uh, is, 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 is very much part of the business case that we developed in 2017, 2018 or so. Um, yeah, maybe not presented in a very vis visible way. So yeah, if, that, if, you, if you feel that's interesting, that's something to that, that could be looked back at and, and, and produced, I guess. Okay, are you happy with that, Liz? Yes, thank you. Right, Rob. Well, thanks, yeah, thanks, Ruben. Great presentation. I just wanted to stress that actually the 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 the, the methods used here are, are, are new to the UK as well. Um, the jet ski bathymetry with with the lidar. Um, enable us to have an overlap. So historically, um, in a lot of the UK modelling, there's a gap between what's recorded on the seabed and what's on the beach. So this is really cutting edge for us here. And the Anglo Coastal Monitoring Programme picked up the, the, the more recent um, uh, monitoring and, and they have been picking this up as well. So I think there's a lot of learning which can be taken from here and I hope will be used elsewhere to improve our, our knowledge of the coast um, in, in the future as well. Um, I was just going to ask you, Yap and Ruben, um, there was some data captured very, very recently, and obviously that's being processed um, at the moment, but I don't know if uh, if there's any sort of, um, any news on that of sort of key things which might be might be obvious or popping out? We haven't seen that data yet, Rob, mm -hmm. so that would be, uh, of course, interesting, but um, yeah. we haven't seen that yet. No, that's, that's what I thought. Lovely, thank you. Okay. Now, I don't think I've got any hands left. I'm, I'm, it's with the um, got me. presentation. Oh, Tony, um, you yeah. are actually wanting to speak, are yeah. you? I, I you can't were just find waving. my hands up uh, electronically. No, the, my, my question is, um, the, with the digital twin, will that be the output from that be available uh, to the general public? That is being able to see what uh, what's going to happen in two, three years time or the, the chance of what's going to be happening in two or three years time. Yeah, so it's it's developed 
uh, it's developed. It was developed with well the the, the beach manager. So that's yeah, people like Rob could live and uh, and 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 the people at the environment agency and uh, and the terminal companies. So in the first instance, it's it's for them. They will um, sort of own own it and uh, and, be, and be able to use it. Um, yeah, I think you'd want to just think through what's the best way of getting information across to the wider public and whether that's this way or whether there's a different format that that, that would be more useful for uh, for a wider for the wider community interest. All right, thank you. That's a very good point, actually. I think we'll, um, if we can make a note of that um, and have a discussion sort of at officer level as to um, how and where we could possibly do that. I mean, there's quite a bit of information on our website, but it probably doesn't go down into such great detail. But very good comment there. Thank you, Tony. Right. I can see there's a hand somewhere. Ah, Brian, hello. Good morning. You want good to morning, Angie. Thank you for that. Thank you, gents. Really excellent presentation. Just a quickie. Do you think there's any possibility of an impact on the updrift end of the system. Um, Munsley this year has probably got the best beach I've seen in the last 20 years, possibly because uh, the downdrift, um, because you've put so much at Backton and from there that what's coming from the updrift side of Munsley is maybe stopping there, mm -hmm. but maybe some came up on the ebb. I just wondered if there's any well, I'm sure there's a possibility of that, but I'd like to hear your opinions. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. It's really good to hear, actually, uh, because uh, we, we haven't analysed the data yet, and we, we, we were seeing a trend. Not so easy to tell because we didn't have quite sure. the right pre-scheme data for Mendesley, but we were seeing indications that it was going that way. And, and actually, when you look at even look at the theory of how a, 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 a big feature on the coast develops like this, like also like we've seen at the sand motor in the Netherlands, it does spread both ways. Even so maybe intuitively sure. you think the, the, the sediment flows in one way. So that's where it's going to feed, but actually that's not actually what happens. It stays in the same place and it spreads out. And so, yeah, really good to see that, um, the, that your practical observations are confirming that. But do you, do you want to add anything, Ruben? No, no, you've captured what I wanted to say perfectly. Uh, it, it, like, like you work with, work with yeah, um, yeah. No, no, what you say is right. Um, at the Zand motor in the Netherlands, there is there is there is that actually that baseline data to to be able to to properly analyze that, and and there you clearly see uh, spreading in both directions. So so we did anticipate that this that that well we hoped that this would happen here as well of course but it's it's really good to hear that that that, that is what you're observing as well yeah no we hoped it would happen we didn't we we, we weren't able to include it in the business case in hindsight sure. maybe we could have yeah. and i think that could be an interesting lesson here that uh, those wider benefits outside the scheme area turn out to be real so that's really okay. good thank you i i have nothing to back that up except visual observation yes. obviously well. but you know <laughs> it's, it's a good beach thank you yep. Right, that's excellent. Um, the only hand I see is Brian's. Oh, sorry, I'll take no, it down. Right. I'm, I'm struggling with this a bit this morning. I do apologise. Uh, right. I think I must add my uh, thanks to both Ruben and Yap. Um, it is really, really encouraging and um, saves us awful lot of worry to know that um, A, you put it there in the first place and, and B, you're well on top of, of how it is performing. And thank you very much for this morning. Now, as I said earlier, uh, sand is the best or a good beach is the best form of sea defence. Um, I'm now going to pass over to Peter Terrington, who's going to talk about his sediment working group there's all sorts of issues to the west of our coast um good morning peter and please go ahead morning can you can you hear me absolutely perfectly good um uh, thank you very much for inviting me it's good to be back in the loop again and it's good to see so many old faces from uh, my time at the district council so uh, Thank you for that. Um, it all came about because I invited, I think it was Rob, to attend one of our sedimentation working group meetings and uh, 
the invitation was rather late. And uh, then I got a call back from Tom sometime later, inviting me to uh, attend this meeting instead. So here I am. I'm afraid it's going to be very much uh, a question of after the Lord Mayor's show, after um, Yap and Ruben's very professional uh, presentation. Um, I haven't done a, a PowerPoint presentation for 15 years, and uh, I can't even remember the last time I did one. So it, it's been a big learning curve, and it's it's pretty amateurish. So, um, but I'll I'll do my best. Um, so uh, ju just a little bit about me before we start then. Uh, I was born in Wells. I've been messing about on the foreshore and sailing and boating and picking cockles and samphire sustainably for just about <laughs> all my life. Um, so uh, this, this is where I'm came, coming from. It's, um, it's the complete opposite to uh, the presentation we just had. Um, the sedimentation working group is very much a DIY group. Um, we've got no professionals in it. Um, we, uh, we, we're, we're all involved because we have had issues with sedimentation in the past. Um, we, um, it's, sedimentation obviously is a very positive thing as we've just seen, it protects the coastline. And um, um, as, as I understand it, we, we, to the west of the county where we are, um, we are on a, a coastline of accretion, which is good. It's going to protect us in the future. I understand that uh, the salt marshes are accreting about three times faster than sea level rise, which is a really positive thing. <clears throat> Obviously, we've got a bit of a time bomb we're sitting on because uh, the reclaimed marshland, which is behind the uh, various seawalls, is about a meter lower than the salt marsh at present. So when the time comes to uh, retreat the line, we we're going to have problems there and we're not going to have uh, much protection um, from any salt marsh in those areas. But anyway, moving on. Um, uh, yes, uh, so the sedimentation working group really is a, a focus group, really. It's more of a forum than a group. We don't actually do anything apart from chat, really, and have people come and chat to us. We come under the North Norfolk Advisory Group, which is uh, one of the three advisory groups of the Washington North Norfolk Marine Partnership. So could we have the next slide, please? Yeah, just a disclaimer, really, because as I said, I haven't done a PowerPoint for years. So I've been uh, sort of scratching around for bits of information. I may have pinched pieces from people. I do apologize if I've used any uh, information that uh, I shouldn't have, but there it is. And uh, obviously anything I say, it might be a bit contentious at points, but it's not intended to malign anybody or any organization. Next slide, please. Yeah, so we're gonna give a brief outline of the, um, the North Norfolk Marine Partnership, because I think that's important to, to um, uh, put this in context, uh, the structure of the sedimentation working group and the current topics that we are sort of studying. Next slide, slide please. Okay, so the, um, I think everybody knows this, the WASH and uh, North Norfolk Marine Partnership was set up um, under the sort of the uh, European maritime protected um, sites, the special areas of conservation and uh, relative authorities have a, uh, uh, sort of form the, the core management group and they have a statutory duty to ensure the protection features within the reserve stay in a good condition. And there we have the regulations. Uh, this, this particular point I interpret a bit more widely. I, the fact that the regulators have to um, maintain the, um, uh, the um, marine protected area and also consider the livelihood and lifestyles of the local people. I also think that applies to any measures they um, implement such as marine licenses or um, exemptions or Assess, um, ascents. Next slide, slide, please. Okay, just looking at the area then, it's the, it's the area really from Gibraltar Point to Weybourne, but the bit I'm interested in is the North Norfolk coast, which is roughly from Hunstanton to uh, Kellinghard, Weybourne. Next one, please. Um, yeah, so, um, the, uh, the advisory group, terms of reference there, we, the advisory group really are a number of people who have an interest 
and uh, gives them the opportunity to meet with the professionals the, of the regulatory authorities and sort of feedback what we see on the ground, which sometimes is different to um, what we're being presented from modeling or from desktop studies or other um, sources of information. Um, so I'm only talking today about one of the three advisory groups, um, which is the North Norfolk Advisory Group based in Wells. Next slide, please. So that, that's the break, uh, breakdown of the North Norfolk Advisory Group. Um, the current community members, which uh, we, we all are on the sedimentation working group, is very much the same as on there. So it's wildfowlers, bait diggers, um, people who get out a lot on the foreshore and observe what's happening. In fact, a lot, uh, some of our best information comes from the bait diggers who are moving along the coastline and they're seeing how the sand uh, uh, moves. I should say that um, obviously it's a complete opposite situation to what was faced in uh, East Norfolk. We have got accretion of sand, as I said, is a good thing, but it does is causing some local difficulties. Um, so also on that advisory group, we it's, um, it's not a requirement, but it's become a tradition that a lot of the relative authorities do attend and it gives us the chances and the, the local people to um, question them and ask them uh, the, their opinion on things and to also to give them our opinions. Um, I have to say that uh, of the, uh, you'll see on there, there's a number of local authorities, there are um, government agencies, and there are um, other organizations set up by Act of Parliament. Um, when dealing with these organizations, it can be difficult for us as local people because they all have different perceptions um, of what um, openness and transparency is. And sometimes it can prove difficult to, to get the information that we, we are asking for. Um, other interesting interested bodies at the bottom there um, who are very supportive, the RSPB, Norfolk Wildlife Trust, National Trust, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, next slide, please. Um, yeah, the, the original aims of the sedimentation group were rather ambitious. Um, we, uh, we were looking for funding to um, do some actually um, uh, tracker tracing of sediment. It, this all came about because of concerns raised, first of all, by sailors mainly, because of the build up of sand and also later on by um, fishermen at mussel fishermen at Morston. They detected that sand was accreting on the mussel beds and they were very concerned. Um, and so uh, uh, various samples were taken of sand. It was inconclusive. And um, we tried to um, get funding to do some uh, research ourselves, but that was rather ambitious. So we um, we abandoned that kind of approach and uh, the um, sedimentation working group was reformed in 2019 with less ambitious aims. Next slide, please. So this is, this is the, uh, the Mark II sedimentation working group and you can see, um, in, I should have mentioned actually, the, um, we've had tremendous support from our project managers of the um, uh, Wash and North Norfolk um, um, Marine Partnership. Sam Lube, uh, the pr pr uh, previous um, manager, um, was very supportive and he was very keen on setting up focus groups so we could look at this problem. Um, after Sam, Adele uh, Powell came along and she was very instrumental in helping us change our, our sort of aims here to a more um, realistic approach. So we're now looking really we, we look and try and identify areas of sedimentation and uh, see what uh, impact these are having on local people. people. Local people come forward in the group and give their experiences. So uh, we don't actually have, um, do a lot really, just listen and talk about it and try to come up with some possible um, mitigation measures. Uh, next slide, please. Sorry, I'm losing my voice. Um, so the membership of the um, sedimentation working group includes individuals and organizations who have experienced the direct impacts of sedimentation. So this could be all, 
all kinds of things. As I mentioned, sailors and um, local fishermen, bait diggers, these are the ones probably have uh, noticed it most. Wildfowlers also are a very good source of uh, information. So it's, we gather information from uh, the observation on our members, and we also try to uh, uh, get information from some of the relevant authorities. Um, we've built up a very good relationship with the uh, with Natural England and the Environment Agency's Coastal Monitoring Team, um, and they have um, given presentations to us and uh, it's sort of uh, given us information that either can contradicts or backs up our observations. Next slide, please. Um, so these are the, the uh, current um, issues that we are looking at, the current case studies. Um, sedimentation monitoring between Wells and Blakeney with the aid, uh, aid of LIDAR difference models um, with the cooperation of the um, Environment Agency. Um, why between Wells and Blakeney? Well, to be quite honest, most of our members are of between Wells and Blakeney. We have very few members west of Wells. So this is why we concentrate mainly on this area. Um, we've also been looking at the transition from a marine management organization license in Wells Harbor for the dredging to a natural England ascent. This has had all kinds of implications, particularly on uh, sailors. And also um, we, we get updates from the Blakeney Channel and the Clyde Harbour Improvement Groups. Next uh, slide, please. Right, so the causes of sedimentation, um, there are natural causes, obviously natural marine processes of erosion, transport, etc., run off from the land. Um, not much we can do about that. Um, certainly it's above the, the pay scale of the sedimentation working group. Combination of natural and, um, and human causes. Um, really these are enhanced processes caused by human action. So we get the secondary transport material resulting from uh, uh, coastal works. Um, and also from dredging, placement of spoil. And then we have the purely human causes where we have direct placement of dredge material on the seabed or on the intertidal areas. And this has caused quite a bit of problem in wells. Next slide, please. Okay, very, very basic, simple slide, but just, just showing you um, some of the issues we face. Obviously pollution is a big problem and that's showing a lot of the source of pollution from within the sea and from the land. But also um, I should have added to this really, the problems of um, sedimentation from um, development in the North Sea and around the edges of the North Sea, coastal works, marine defences, um, wind farm development, dredging in, um, in harbours and channels. Next slide, please. So yeah, just going on then to the sediment between Wells and Blakeney. Um, next slide, please. Okay. Um, this comes from the um, environment state, environmental statement of the uh, uh, plan, the project to dredge the, the harbour in Wells and build a jetty for the wind farm industry. Um, you can see there, that's the low water um, um, movement of sediment from Blakeney towards Wells. You can see it's, a, it's the standard one from east to west, which we all sort of learn about. Um, can we go on to the next one, please? This is the upper tidal system, which is more um, appropriate really to what we're doing. It shows the tidal movement um, offshore from west to east. It also shows a near shore movement of um, tidal current from west to east. It also shows tidal, um, sorry, um, wind action um, causing longshore drift from either onshore or from west to east. So this, this shows that there's a lot of movement of material at the upper tidal level, moving material from um, Wells towards Blakeney. Uh, next slide, please. All right, um, this is the, um, we've had two meetings um, of the group since we reformed, and we've had two presentations from the Anglian Coastal Monitoring Group. They've been very useful. So they've um, 
they've shared with us the data available. Um, if anybody's tried using the uh, environmental data themselves, I find it very difficult. Um, it's, it's been very useful for them to come along and actually explain it to us and also produce some um, slides on um, the um, uh, difference models, height difference models, which we couldn't produce ourselves from the public website, but the uh, Environment Agency has done this for us. Um, this is, we've talked about a summary of the data that's available from Holm to Weybourne, and we've had an overview of the, um, the um, LIDAR difference models, which I just talked about. And we've also discussed future work and uh, other studies which are coming out. Next slide, please. Okay, then this is basically the, the, the result of the LIDAR difference models. That's um, in the left-hand side of the slide, there's wells. Um, the green is the, um, the, where we have um, sedimentation of between uh, 0.25 of a meter and one meter. That's a light green. Um, the area to look at really is the area in the middle between the um, East Hills, if anybody knows that area, and the Wells Channel to the west. Um, you can see there's a buildup of sands. Looks small on there, but it's right on the edge of um, the eelgrass beds, which uh, we're very concerned about. Um, next slide, please. That's the buildup of sand within Wells Harbour. Um, and this is for the uh, difference between 1516 and 2019-20. So you can see there's a huge buildup of sand to the south of the outer harbour in the north of the slide. Obviously, that's the sort of thing that um, um, uh, buildup of sand of a metre can be have severe um, problems for sailors, recreational sailors, when they're trying to navigate um, outside the main channel. Um, so that's a, a problem for them. And also, of course, uh, one meter of sand is a lot of sand if it, when it comes to um, uh, sensitive habitats like mussel beds and um, uh, eelgrass beds. Next slide, please. There's a picture for Blakeney, Blakeney Point there. Um, you can see there's tremendous buildup of sand. We've gone up to the next level there at Blakeney Point. Um, there is a hot spot of erosion in the red area there to the um, southwest of the core of the slide. And there's also um, um, just, I don't know if you're familiar with the area of Blakeney Harbour, I haven't got a point, I'm afraid, but um, just sort of south of the, what's known as the Simpole, you'll see a, a buildup of sand there, which was um, one of the monitoring points when we collected the, uh, the samples for um, analysis in 2013. Um, next slide, please. Um, okay, uh, we also had a presentation from um, Jennifer Love of Natural England uh, talking about the uh, change from the, um, nat the marine management license for the dredging and wells, which had been in operation since it started in 2009. Um, an exemption was granted for this in 2021 and um, the um, responsibility for um, the, the habitats was taken over by Natural England through an ascent. This left um, a bit of a concern because it didn't cover any of the protection that the marine license gave to recreational sailors, for instance, all the um, conditions that protected uh, height of berms and height of um, sand banks, et cetera, and placement areas were removed at that point. So the Natural England Ascent only covers um, um, impact on the environment, uh, particularly on eelgrass beds and on the placement of clay. Next slide, slide please. Right, so that's, that's the actual ascent that was um, awarded or um, given that last year. Next slide, please. Impact of um, sedimentation on the projected habitats. First of all, the eelgrass and then the mudflats. Next slide, please. Um, this, this is the, uh, the area in the center of the first slide I showed you. There is a picture of the eelgrass taken this year. Looks in pretty good condition, but you can see a very fine mobile sand moving in from the west, which is um, causing concern. Um, next slide, please. 
Um, so annealed gas monitoring is now only takes place every five years. Um, this was uh, the condition to re, um, monitor it more regularly every year was removed in 2018. Um, but it's very important that uh, next year we have a, a proper survey. There is one uh, uh, due next year. As I said, it hasn't been um, surveyed for five years. Um, it's a very sensitive habitat. Next slide, please. Okay. And uh, why, uh, why we were concerned about it? Well, this is the um, this is the ecological monitoring port of two, report of 2016, and uh, very worryingly, it said that the um, the area of eel glass had, has declined over the period of monitoring, which was since the dredging started, from 21 hectares to 15 hectares. Next slide, please. Um, just threw this in. I pinched this from the Natural England, just to show that. Uh, um, the concern that um, sedimentation has on different uh, um, habitats. This is what happens under mud. Um, you can see there's all kinds of different, I won't go through them, different uh, little bugs and creatures live there. Next slide, please. So the impact of clay now on protected habitats. Next slide, please. Okay. Um, this is condition of the ascent and also of, was of the marine license. The Wells Harbor Commissioners mustn't ins must ensure that no clay material is removed from the seabed or disposed of within the marine environment um, because um, deepening of the channel is not permitted. Good reason for this, I'll come over, come to in a moment. Next slide, please. Um, it, it, it concerns really, first of all, the placement of waste um, under the um, ascent the commissioners can uh, deposit non-hazardous waste. When you get to clay, this can be classed as hazardous waste because it contains a lot of nasty things. Basically, some very fancy names there, but basically it's uh, um, th things as a, uh, for a result of coal, crude oil or gasoline, coolants and lubricants from electrical equipment, pesticides, and the last one there, are some of these nasty chemicals which would take a long while to break down. Next slide, please. So um, this, um, I don't think there'll be time, but I've got a few um, um, trigger events at the end of the presentation, which I could go through, but this is an example of a clay uh, being deposited on sand on the outer harbour. As you know, in, in the conditions, this is a complete no-no, but there is a large, um, um, amount of clay there that's been deposited um, that has been uh, dredged from the inner harbour. Next slide, please. Um, the reason why, well, there was a trial of a very fancy vessel, which was um, one of the um, wind farm supply vessels. And you can see when it's in under motion, it it's, uh, has a very shallow draft, but when it's in the outer harbour, it sinks down to its plimsoll line or wherever its water line and draws about three metres, which was one of the reasons, presumably, that the uh, outer harbour was um, over deepened. Next slide, please. Nearly finished. Um, this is a slide of um, last week, clay being uh, dredged and deposited in, in the uh, inner harbour. And of course, under the terms of the ascent, no clay should be um, being dredged or deposited at all. Next slide, please. Um, this is again a little slide showing uh, what you get under sand different types of creepy crawlies there and clams and razor shells, etc. If you dump clay on top of that, obviously um, it's not gonna be compatible with the, uh, with the habitat. Next slide, please. Um, this is the impact of sedimentation on the Blakeney mussel beds. Um, this was first reported in 2012 by the Blakeney Harbour Mussel Society. Um, the situation has declined to such an extent that the, what was a very healthy um, uh, muscle, muscle re of 30 acres has now declined to less than one acre today. And the, the one person I think continuing to harvest mussels is thinking of not bothering in future. Um, alternative methods of cultivation have been tried, like growing the mussels on rafts, but this is supposed to be unviable. Um, next slide, please. Um, this is just an aerial photograph looking back towards Blakeney Point from sort of the Cly area. You can see a little blue dot in the, the distance. Um, 
that is the area where we took the samples for the sand and just to the, uh, the right of that, north of that, is the area where the Blakeney mussel beds are. Um, they are um, subtitle mussel beds, I understand, which means they grow quicker and faster and produce better mussels. Very different to the mussel beds, say in wells, which are intertidal. Um, but these, these mussel beds did suffer from the accretion of sand very badly over the, well, from the period actually, dredging started in wells. We do, I'm not saying there is a connection, but that was the suspicion at the time. Next slide, slide please. Um, right, and then we have the impact of sedimentation and placement of sand on recreational sailing. Large volumes of sand have been placed directly on the seabed and have reduced the area of navigable water for recreational craft. Um, elsewhere, sand has been transported by natural processes and deposited in forming shoals. Next slide, please. And uh, there's just a um, slide showing that one of the berms, as they call them, where sand was deposited, where it's completely cut off the, um, the uh, main channel, which you can see the boats in, in the uh, far distance from the traditional sort of recreational sailing area in the near ground. Next slide, please. And uh, I'll, I'll finish here because otherwise I can see I'm going over time. Um, that's a, one of the early uh, photographs of the berm. The berm was supposed to be kept at one meter OD. You can see there by the size of that gentleman when we surveyed the berm, it's, uh, it was well over that height. And so it was causing all kinds of problems to, to recreational sailors. Okay, um, just, uh, I think I'll end there. Then there's a few more slides, but they're not really relevant. Um, are they? Yeah, just flick, flick through them really, go on. Um, keep going, keep going. Okay, that, that was a nice little one. That was just to show that uh, perhaps um, we need to uh, listen perhaps to local people and what local people say sometimes that um, we can be conned by uh, people into thinking things are better than uh, they are. Okay, next slide, please. And that's the end, really. Any, any questions? I'm sorry I've rushed through it, but uh, I've never done a PowerPoint for many years and uh, I wasn't quite sure of the timing. Thank you. No, Peter, thank you very much. I found that absolutely fascinating and reeled back several years. And I think Tony Thomas is still on the call. Um, he and I used to be part of a club operating out of Wales Harbour. Um, and the change is, is quite extraordinary. I mean, I'm talking back to the 70s and things have changed enormously. Um, I see there's one question in the chat in from Noel. Could you bear with me? I'll put it up. Chemicals that need to be tested in the clay, have any tests been carried out? Was anything found? Was it of a concentration that would cause concern? Right, now th this is the big problem. Um, um, there was sampling carried out along the, uh, the main berm and sampling, was, um, but because all the samples were sand uh, or sand or gravel, there was no need to look to sample for those nasty chemicals that I mentioned in one of the earlier slides. Um, there, there has, as far as I know, there, and it's difficult to get hold of this information, but as far as I know, there's been no sampling of clay at all. So, uh, in, which means that uh, we, we have no idea what, uh, what the um, uh, content of the clay is. It could well be perfectly harmless or it could contain a lot of those nasties. Okay, that's a bit of a worry, Peter. Maybe we should um, mm. think about that altogether. Now, I'm going to double check, but I don't see any hands up, in which case it is now uh, 20 minutes past 11. Um, I think we could have a comfort break um, until 11.30, if that's all right with everybody. So I'm going to shut down um, and see you all at half past 11.